Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Patrick Neese. I'm the classical music writer for the Kansas City Star, and I'm really honored and pleased to be the host of this uh, talk tonight with two people who have done so much for the arts in Kansas City, making really unique contributions to the arts in Kansas City through the uh, music they perform. Matthew Christopher Shepard, the founder and artistic director of Te Deum, and Trilla Ray Carter, an amazing cellist and a the founder and director of Kansas City Baroque Consortium. They have a big concert coming up this coming weekend, which they will talk to you about, the music of Monteverdi. So uh, before we get into that talk, uh, welcome, Matthew and Trilla. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Patrick. We're really delighted to be here to talk about um, some of the exciting music we're going to be presenting this weekend. Absolutely. Monteverdi does not get heard hardly ever in concert, especially in Kansas City. You know, one of his most famous pieces is his Marian Vespers of 1610. But this isn't what you guys are going to be doing. Matthew has constructed a new Vespers uh, using uh, the music of Monteverdi. Uh, Matthew, why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, I so the, the the name the Venetian Vespers of 1641 is is one that I made up and it is admittedly a little confusing um and yet it explains exactly what this is. Um uh, I have used a a his his publication from 1641 that's called the Selva Morale, the the spiritual forest. It's this large publication of of dozens and dozens of works. Um, that's a forest of, of spiritual music. Um, and from that publication, I have pulled out the appropriate Psalms and the, uh, and the Magnificat that would have likely been used in Venice, almost, almost assuredly used in Venice while Monteverdi was the music director uh, there for a, a a regular Sunday Vespers service. So I've I, I've chosen to do a liturgical reconstruction of a Vespers service as one might have experienced in the early 17th century um, in Venice, and I, using the, the the 1641 publication of the Selva Morale. So that's where the title, the 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 Venetian Vespers, a Vespers that would have happened in Venice of 1641, because I'm using his Selva Morale publication of 1641 to provide the the primary meat of the, the, the musical meat of the Vesper service. Now, you know, as I said, you know, Monteverdi rarely gets heard in concert uh, here or anywhere, really. Uh, so people don't have a lot of experience hearing Monteverdi. Uh, he kind of straddled the late Renaissance and the Baroque. How would you describe Monteverdi's music? Well, it depends on the piece. Even within the Selva Morale, he has pieces that are in the Renaissance style. Um, and even in this concert, um, there are pieces that are in sort of a late Renaissance polychoral style. You'll hear in the um, Memento David uh, with the fifth psalm that we're singing, you'll hear the two choirs singing back and forth. And you could maybe imagine them in uh, St. Mark's in Venice from balconies singing back and forth. Um, also, the, the Magnificat is, is in a little bit more of a, a late Renaissance style, not completely. Uh, but then some of the other pieces are, are absolutely um, cutting edge musical material. Um, the, the Baroque that, that came about, which wasn't a term they used then, um, the term that Monteverdi coined was the Secunda Pratica. Uh, actually, in, in one of his, um, he, he published his book of madrigals that was in this new style that had basso continuo and wasn't this beautiful ethereal polyphony, but was something agitated and excited. And uh, there was a famous theorist in the day who who wrote a scathing review of this this music. And, and Monteverdi's retort was was to say no i'm not I, i'm not changing what was that was the prima pratica this is just the secunda pratica this is just a second way of doing things and so we see that in um especially the first four psalms that we sing we uh, that we'll sing in this vesper service you'll see the the height of what this secunda pratica is how would you describe uh, the difference between uh, the late Renaissance and Baroque in as, it, as it's expressed in Monteverdi's music. Um, I, I'll be curious to hear too, to hear how Trilla has experienced it in, in her own way. Um, but I can say from, from my perspective, the biggest difference is the hyper expressivity of 
every word that I think in the Renaissance, it's okay, this text is about this overall text is about peace. And so then the whole the whole song sounds about like it's about peace, or it's about the crucifixion. And so the whole piece sounds like it's about the crucifixion. And as the Renaissance was was getting into the late Renaissance and madrigals were at their height, they were they were trying to express words as clearly as as possible. Um, and especially in the Renaissance, I would say that the goal was to lift the listener, specifically the congregant who's at church, to sort of take them out, out of this earthly plane that's that's full of pain and difficulty and to sort of take them to uh, a, a more heavenly, peaceful place. That was the goal of Renaissance music. But the Baroque said, no, let's express everything. Let's express human experience. And that includes the good, but that includes the bad. And so what you what you get is rapidly changing um, vocal lines and instrumental lines as every word needs to sound as sort of onomatopoetic as it can. Huh? Uh, Trilla, in your storied career, have you performed much Monteverdi? Not not a lot, for sure. Um, I have done the um, 1610 Monteverdi. We, we did that here in Kansas City with um, Robert Bodie when he first came to UMKC as the choral director. Um, there may be a few other little spots here and there, but I mean, Monteverdi is, is, there's not a lot of instrumental music that he wrote that was just purely instrumental. And that's sort of my, that's my, my world. Um, but, uh, and so it's typically with a chorus or a choral group that's doing some, some Monteverdi. Um, but I've certainly done a lot of music of his colleagues and his contemporaries, um, which I think really reflect a lot of what Matthew has been talking about in this move from late Renaissance into early Baroque. I think it's so important to recognize and remember there were no rules. There were no musical rules at this time. These guys were these guys and the few women um, that we barely get to hear about or know about. Um, they were pioneers. They were, they were figuring out how this language of music works and what works better and what else could we do? So I think this, this drive to, especially in Monteverdi's works to, for this hyper expressivity of, of the word and finding out how can the musical language illustrate what we're trying to express with just the words. Um, we see that instrumentally in different ways. I mean, there is a great focus on what we call the rhetoric. Rhetoric was a big deal. They were, they were researching and strongly influenced by the, the rhetorical um, concepts that the Greeks spoke about centuries before. So we're now, the, the broke um, artists are using these concepts of rhetoric and finding out how can we express this in a rhetorical way. So this is what we see instrumentally. We see rhetorical phrases that are often much shorter than we hear in the classical era or in the romantic era and beyond short little phrases, often quite speakable. I often, when I'm teaching Bach to my students, I'm, I say, let's explore the rhetoric of this piece. Da -da -deem, pa -da -dum, pa -da -dum, -de -da -dum, using these little syllables and see how they've built this wonderful work. So I think um, for, for the instrumentalists, I think it's a fascinating exploration to see this connection to the vocal world, which really, I think, informed this first exploration in the Baroque era. Now, Matthew, you know, as Trilla mentioned, there weren't many rules in that early music. And I know that you're kind of like, uh, you know, having some fun with your creativity with this and with Trilla, uh, especially the use of instrumental music as the antiphons. Can you talk about that a little bit? 
So, as mentioned, this is a liturgical reconstruction of a, a, a Vesper service, as, as might have happened in Venice. Um, and what they often did is, um, for a normal Vesper service, if you've come to any of Tedeum's chanted Vesper services, then you would have experienced this. And that is that they chant an antiphon. It's 15 seconds long, but a, a little short sentence that, that speaks something meaningful about the psalm that's about to be heard that connects it to that day of worship. And so they sing that antiphon, you then sing the psalm, and then you repeat the antiphon. Uh, but what happened in Venice a lot is when it was time to repeat that antiphon, they would replace that with something else, sometimes an organ piece, sometimes a different vocal piece um, that used a different text, not the proper antiphon text, and sometimes with just an instrumental piece. So that's what we've chosen to do here is the, re the antiphon repeat is actually going to be um, replaced by instrumental pieces throughout the whole Vesper service. And Trill, I understand for these instrumental pieces, they're not by Monteverdi, is that right? Right, as I mentioned just, just a moment ago, that there, there isn't much in the way of purely instrumental music that Monteverdi wrote. So when, when Matthew and I began talking about this collaboration and he described how he saw this program coming together, um, I love the idea of the fact that, that, that we had an opportunity to sort of bring in some some um, instrumental works from from the era and from the period because I think it's a wonderful juxtaposition of this um, wonderful music and this the height of what Monteverdi had brought um, at this point. So, um, but but what I discovered is this little concept of adding instrumental pieces was was actually quite um, quite a challenge because these antiphons, these instrumental antiphons still needed to serve the Vesper service as a whole. So I felt like the, the pieces really needed to, I needed to find instrumental works that reflected the movement that we were, that, that, that we were following, or it could be a contrast to, um, I mean, there were just a lot of ways. There had to be some talk, some kind of a relationship between these two works that really worked. Um, and that was a real challenge. But I just started with finding finding colleagues of Monteverdi. I just did sort of a, a survey of all the, the composers that were connected to Monteverdi in some way, and many who were connected and played in his orchestras at um, St. Mark's. Um, many of the composers I've, I've done and I've played and performed, um, but it was still challenging to find just the work that seemed to pair well with each of these movements. Um, and I, I, I would compare it to, to what the curator at the Nelson must feel like. It's like, well, here we have this masterpiece. Now, what are we gonna pair with it? How are we gonna balance or create a conversation between this work and these other works by other masters? Um, so you'll have to, you all, all will have to tell me at the end of the concert if I was successful. Um, it's definitely an experiment. Um, I did a lot of a lot of research and a lot of listening and a lot of considering. I mean, there are some basics that we had to consider. It's like, is there a key relationship that won't shock the listener's ears moving from, from one key to the next? So it had to have some connection or close relationship key-wise, but it also had to have um it had to have a, a feel or it had to have a I mean a subjective, for me, it was a subjective message. What does this piece say instrumentally? How does it communicate to the movement that we've just heard? Um, it's It's been a, a fascinating exploration. And I've loved every minute of it. And I think we've come up with some really fantastic works that I think not only um, complement these movements of the Vespers, um, but also uh, might broaden your awareness and understanding and expand your ear to um, the sound of this music from the Seconda Practica, the second practice, as we're, we're sort of developing this Baroque rhetoric into, um, into the 1600s.
Matthew uh, Tadeum has become quite known in Kansas City, I think, as being uh, fantastic performers of plain chant, you know, which is Gregorian mm -hmm. chant, basically. Uh, and you will be uh, utilizing some plain chant in this Monteverdi. Uh, so it'll be both Monteverdi's choral music with plain chant. Is that the way it would have been done in Monteverdi's day? Absolutely. I mean, even even then, even with Monteverdi and all the other Baroque composers and with all the Renaissance composers, still the music that would have been most familiar to a congregant would be plain chant. That, that, that is still what was the, the, the grounding, the foundation of everything, and what was heard most often, especially if you're in a monastery and you're, you're doing a Vespers every single day, as well as the other prayer hours that happen every day, you're, you're steeped in that. Um, one thing that I think is, is, almost, is unfortunate in uh, today's time where we're used to uh, big choral pieces that are, that are exciting and beautiful is that we don't have that we can't feel that same sense of awe that that modern, I'm sorry, not modern, but that the Monteverdi's listener must have experienced when they do the antiphon, the 17, 15 second long antiphon and chant, and then the instruments come in and the double choir starts singing. Um, how, how sort of explosively joyful and, um, and uh, expressive that must have been. That was only slightly your question. Yes, there's going to be chant in this concert. Um, preceding every choral piece, uh, which is five psalms, five psalms and one Magnificat. That is the the standard expectation in a regular Vesper service. Um, there is an antiphon that precedes it. Um, in addition, we are going to open the concert with what is the opening uh, chanted prayer that starts a Vesper service. Uh, we're leaving out the, the scripture reading that would have been chanted and a couple of other prayers and verses. So it's not going to be technically a complete Vesper service, but it is going to be every um, polyphonic musical uh, uh, musical piece of a Vesper service with the with the flavor of the proper chants sprinkled in to give that sense of, of contrast. Contrast, which is what we were talking about when we're talking about what makes Baroque music exciting, especially early Baroque music. It is contrast. Trilla, I think, is the one who who said this, but every phrase changes so radically. And it, and, it, and it really is all about contrast. And so we've been having a great time figuring out, okay, well, we have three different continuo instruments, um, chordal instruments, plus the cello. Who's going to play when and how are we going to mix that up to heighten the amount of contrast? Because if it's all of the same thing the whole time, it's it's not what it's not what would have been done, and is not what is most exciting. What's most exciting is is heightened contrast. I, I know that there is a lot of freedom allowed to the conductor of uh, music of this time, and you get to choose which what instruments you even need to use. Can you tell us about what instruments we can expect to hear? Uh, Trilla, why don't you start by by telling us who's in the band? Okay, um, <clears throat> our concert master is Daniel Lee. He is uh, a fantastic violinist out of New York. He also teaches at Yale. Um, he has his own early, early music um, Baroque ensemble, the Sebastians out of New York. So you can check him out. Fantastic recordings available on YouTube. Um, so he is, he's actually living in the Midwest now because his other love, his other um, calling, besides being a fantastic early music a uh, professional is that of a pastor. And so he is in his first year as a pastor in a small church in Willard, Missouri. So this is a huge gift to us in the Midwest because he's not always available, but he's often available to come and join us um, for our, our early music events. So we're very excited that he's going to be joining us. My husband, Monty Carter, will be playing on second violin. So there'll be two violins. I'm on cello, obviously. And then we have um, a Fiorbo player, a Fiorbo often called, <laughs> when, they, when they enter the stage, people often think, is this a weapon of mass destruction? <laughs> or is this long sword-like thing coming? And oh, and here's the person carrying it. So the Fiorbo is a bass lute. So it has very, very long strings. Um, really creating the low resonance needed 
um, to support the base line or what we call the continual line. And then it has the smaller section of strings like the regular lute that can play more chordal and sometimes more melodically um, when needed. Um, our, our Thorbo player is coming from Chicago, Brandon Acker, fantastic player. Um, and we have joining us also um, a, 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 a harpist, Baroque harpist. Um, he's from Topeka. Uh, Matthew, I uh, see Donald Livingston. I'm, Donald I'm just, Livingston. Yeah, pulling up his name. Donald Livingston. He's the the new organ uh, organist at Grace Cathedral, and has tremendous early music experience that he brings with him. And he reached out to to Matthew um, when he saw us start beginning to advertise this, and he said, "You probably didn't know, but I'm actually a Baroque harpist, <laughs> and I would love to come and be a part of this." So we were we were doing a, a dance of joy over here. So we're really excited to include that into the mix. This really special color, um, and then of course Elisa Bickers on organ. Um, which is the fantastic for all of us to get to work with such an such a great musician. Are, we, are, are there no theorbists in Kansas City? No, there are no theorbists in Kansas City. There's a lutenist. Um, there is a theorbo player in St. Louis that I've used often, Jeff Noonan, who used to teach at Southeast Missouri State and is a great musicologist as well, um, and has played on many of Casey Baroque's concerts. But he was not available, can so we had a, to go. Can you we, bring a theorbo on the plane with you? You have to buy a seat. <laughs> so we did buy a seat for Brandon to bring his theorbo. Now his theorbo is a special traveling theorbo. It has a hinged neck, so it folds over into a smaller case, but it's still not small enough to fit in the overhead. And he <laughs> says it makes me too nervous to do that. And I'll, that's okay. I'm a cellist. We're going to buy you a seat. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Matthew, it, it, you mentioned earlier that uh, these Vespers are often performed partic for particular feast days. Mm. Uh, uh, this Vespers that you have uh, reconstructed, uh, did you have a feast day in mind for it? Um, well, when I first thought of this project, I did not, which is why the title is Venetian Vespers of 1641. Uh, but actually, as I continued to dive into the research, I, I learned of this um, journal entry in a, uh, from 1620 of a Dutch man who was traveling with some other government officials from the Netherlands. They were traveling through Italy, and he was in Venice. Now, first, start by remembering that these Dutch men were Calvinists. This is no instrumental music in church. Unison psalm singing is all that's allowed. And then as they're traveling, and they go to Venice, and they go to a Vesper service for the feast of St. John the Baptist. They go to the St. John the Baptist feast, uh, Vesper service, and he writes in his journal that this is has to be the most exciting music he's ever heard in his life and ever will hear again. And he talked about there were four theorbos. Um, how many plane tickets was that? Um, <laughs> four theorbos, um, several guitars, um, uh, bass, cello. There were trombones. There were a number of instruments. Um, and some of the most exciting music he ever heard. And I thought that actually is something that would be fun to try to recreate. Um, uh, the, the feast day for St. John the Baptist is June 24. So we're only a few weeks ahead of that. We're in the right month. Um, and so I, I've actually used that concept to build this program. Now, we're not going to have four theorbos. And the trombones he speaks of, in these pieces, Monteverdi writes that they're optional. Um, and we weren't able to find sack butts, and we weren't able to make that happen for this concert. Um, so we have certainly a, a slightly pared down orchestra. But the idea uh, it was to try to model this Vespers on this uh, journal entry that we know happened, that Monteverdi, we know Monteverdi was leading in 1620 of a, of a Vespers for the Feast of St. John the Baptist. So uh, while it's not in the title of this, of this program, this concert we're doing, um, I, I, for instance, had to change out the fifth psalm. Uh, the first four psalms are the same. 
but I had a different piece chosen for the fifth psalm because it's for a more a standard Sunday service. But when I decided to to transition and make this specifically a feast day for St. John the Baptist, I had to had to go back to his Silva Morale publication and find the correct psalm for uh, a feast for St. John the Baptist. I see. How many singers are in Tadeum? We've got 25 in this concert, and that that's the roster that we, we normally have. Um, and, and actually, I'd been- say... Would that have been typical for Monteverdi? So we know that Monteverdi in Venice had a roster of about 34 singers. We also know he would never have hired them all on the same Sunday. Um, And he had multiple churches he sometimes needed to to send singers to. So it's very unlikely he ever would have used that many. And there's some scholarship and research that suggests 12 singers for this very same Vespers would be enough. In fact, that journal entry uh, that I mentioned from 1620 by Konstantin Huygens, um, his journal entry of 1620, I think um, he said that there were about 12 singers. So while there were all these other instruments, there were only about 12 singers in that service. So um, us using 24 is is absolutely within the realm of possibility of what Monteverdi did, but it is certainly on the large side, and it's absolutely larger than what seems to be common these days. I would say that, you know, you mentioned, Patrick, that Monteverdi's not heard much. Uh, and I think one of the things that has happened is that music, Monteverdi's music specifically, has has been relegated to specialist ensembles that do one on a part singing and 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 then groups that have that, that are larger um that maybe aren't specialists only in early 17th century baroque music um that that they feel like it's a bit off limits and for me it was very important that i that i give as many people the opportunity to hear and sing this music as possible uh, so it was i didn't want to pare down the ensemble sometimes for renaissance concerts we've we've had a smaller group 16 voices so i could have pared it down but it was this music is way too exciting and i wanted every one of my singers to have the experience uh to be a part of it and and it's it, it's really come to life in, in these rehearsals we've had so far well, I, you know, I've heard some of these smaller scale performances of Monteverdi on record, and they're lovely, but I really think Monteverdi benefits from having a big, full choir like yours. It just adds to that splendor. Of- well, s- splendor and contrast. So what we'll do is sometimes there are duets that happen, and that'll be pared down to just one on a part. So you'll hear two singers. Sometimes you'll hear an octet, but then at the big climatic moment, you'll hear all 25 singers come in and it, it, it allows for greater contrast. And I think that's one of the real benefits um, of having the larger ensemble. As I hear the recordings of these phenomenal early music groups that have recorded Monteverdi, um, that is the one, that is one of the things I think is lacking is the ability to contrast dynamically with the singing. Uh-huh. Yeah. Excellent. Well, should we uh, take some questions from any of our I've, listeners? I'll say that I, I've peeked at the chat, and there are some really good questions. So, yeah, why don't we stop just talking ourselves and, and transition to the chat? I think it's a great idea. Sure. So uh, let's see here. I'm uh, technically illiterate, but let me see uh, some of these uh, questions. Uh, are they in the chat? Are They're in the chat. chat. I, I can read these out. I can read these out, Patrick. All right. Um. I'm going to make sure I don't, haven't missed anybody here. Um, Jonathan Perry has asked an uh, interesting question that I'm not at the moment um, going to be able to answer very thoroughly or at all. Uh, he's asked about a comparison of Monteverdi's Beatus Vir, uh, which is Psalm 111, and Vivaldi. Vivaldi, who also has a setting. Um, I don't have Vivaldi's fresh enough on my mind to be able to speak too thoroughly about this. But but what I can say is is I can go back to what Trilla talked about is how there were no rules and in the early part of the Baroque. Um, and with Bach, we definitely think about Bach being this learned musician and um, everything fits perfectly into place and the fugue is so mathematical. Um, and while Vivaldi has sort of the Italian spirit and joy that that is that is the contrast with Bach, uh, Vivaldi is still of that later Baroque camp that uh, there were rules to be followed and there were sort of formulas that were followed. And if if Bach and and Vivaldi are your wise elder statesmen, 
Monteverdi is your adolescent who's had way too much sugar. It's just <laughs> all over the place, full of full of uh, kinetic energy and joy in a way that is different from the joy we get from Vivaldi or from Bach. Great. Uh, G yeah, Gene Wilson asked if uh, the chorus will be a cappella, and then the Baroque Consortium comes in with the instruments, um, and, and if it goes back and forth. Um, to which I can say no. There, there will it will be accompanied at all times. Um, it's accompanied in a couple of different ways. So the the continuo instruments will always be there. Now sometimes it'll just be organ. Sometimes it'll be the plucked instruments only. Sometimes it'll be everybody plus trilla on the cello. Um, so there's there's different ways to do it, and there were no rules except to express the text and make contrast happen. So all the decisions that you'll hear we've just had to make up there when you pull vivaldi off off the you know the vivaldi score off the off the shelf there's nothing there for an in an hour and 20 minutes of music there's not a single dynamic given there's not a single tempo marked um there's very little instrumentation uh, offered um we have to make those decisions on how to make this music come to life uh so there's all that is to say there's always going to be continuo accompanying the choir um, in some of the pieces, especially the, the Secunda Pratica, the stuff that less resembles Renaissance music, so especially what you'll hear in the first four psalms, um, there are independent violin parts. And you'll actually hear them almost like another choir. So you'll hear the choir sing a phrase, and then you'll hear the violins echo it. And it sounds a little bit polychoral that way. You'll hear that sometimes. Um, whereas in the Memento, the fifth psalm, there is no there are no independent violin parts. They're just doubling the soprano and the alto. And that was a very common practice even in the Renaissance to have the vocal lines. We think of, most of us will think of Renaissance music as being a cappella, but actually, especially later in the Renaissance, it was very common that, that they would have been doubled by instruments. Um, and that's what, so that's how we perform, uh, for instance, the memento, uh, uh, David, that the, the fifth psalm, we just double with it with the violin. So there will be instruments at all times, um, I guess, except in the chant. The chant will be a cappella. Okay, great. Um, I mentioned already the size of the choir. I'm reading another question here. There was a question also what, what the original makeup of the choir was. I, I mentioned that there were 34 voices on the roster, so probably never used that many, but, but had that many at his disposal. Um, he did use boys, um, so it is different these days that we will use female voices. He would have had a, a number of, of virtuosic female singers um, in his operas. So in, in the secular stage, that was appropriate. But still in church, they would have had the boys who were, um, who were in a monastery and who were training would have been a part of that. Uh -huh. um, and those boys weren't, wouldn't be paid, but usually what would happen back then is, is families would, would sort of send their child to the monastery, and then the monastery will take care of the boy financially at that point. Um, sort of almost offering a boy to God in a way, um, mm -hmm. offering them to the monastery, and then they have um, what, what could be a, 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 a very successful life going through the monastery as a young boy, um, then sort of upon graduation-like age, um, could sort of go on to be a priest or could go other directions at that point. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read this question out loud um, because I don't want to, I can't want to waste 10 seconds processing it. When considering instrumental pieces, this will be a good question for Trilla. When considering instrumental pieces to answer the choral parts written by Monteverdi, were you trying normally to produce an instrumental message that was in contrast to the previous text or one that was more in sync with it? That's a great question. I would say both. Um, I, th I think I, you know, having gathered the potential repertoire that I thought could work, um, taking that next step, which was listening, listening really fully to the Vespers as a whole, and then each movement, knowing these instrumental pieces that I was considering, you know, it's like I I I would just try them out. I'm like, let me hear, let me hear how the end of this Vespers movement comes, and then what does this feel like to hear this next? So some some of the works will be um, you might you might they might seem like commentary, 
some are a full contrast, except for especially some of the movements are they end so they're they're so involved and so big that I felt there really needs to be sort of a rest. And so, in fact, one of the pieces that I chose this is not even an instrument instrumental piece, but I but we created an instrumental version of it. It's a beautiful um, uh, piece by Monteverdi, O Primavera. Um, it's one of his madrigals, and I happened to come across a, a viol consort, a viola da gamba consort, playing it, and it just kind of stuck with me. And then when I came back, and I was really struggling to f- to fill this spot, this came back to me and I thought, I wonder how that fits. So I listened to the recording and placed them side by side and thought about it. And I thought it's the perfect sort of release or um, clearing of the air a little bit. So each, I think each of these movements serves a different purpose, but I feel like each one for me um, in my gut said, this works. So you can let me know what you think at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Bethany and David have asked an interesting question. What are you attempting to convey to 21st century listeners of this music? And what does this music mean to you today? Um, I guess since I programmed the, designed the program, I'll respond uh, and say, first, in part, uh, something I've already alluded to, this music isn't done very often, and when it is, it's done for specialist groups. One of the things uh, that I want to convey is that this is music for everybody. Everyone can sing it um, and should, and I, I want to sort of make it available to listeners as well as to singers. Um, but then more importantly, uh, to sort of you all as listeners, what I what I want to convey is that this is not a chance to sort of sit back and hear what I might call museum music. Like, oh, wasn't that quaint what they did back then? Um, instead, what I, I hope you'll experience, what I believe you'll experience is, wow, this has something compelling and exciting to say today. Now, this is specifically talking about, this is specifically psalms and religious music. So if 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 that is text that doesn't um, connect to you already on a personal level, um, I think though musically, you'll still be wowed by the, by the virtuosity and by the um, sort of acrobatic contrast that happens, that this is in no way sort of stodgy and old, but is alive and and I think we all would benefit from its uh, more frequent performance. I'm going to just jump in and also, Please. I think this is this idea of the relevance of early music to today has been one of the motivating factors in all of all of my programming for Casey Baroque. Um, even in our first year where we juxtaposed modern uh, we, or contemporary art forms with early music was sort of my first attempt at saying this music is still relevant. It gives us context, um, I think, in, in its musical expression because it is a timeless expression, but also the recognition of how this music can respond to our contemporary world, to our contemporary art. So in our first concert, we did mid-century architecture. The second concert was contemporary um, painting. And in the final concert, it was contemporary dance with the Owen Dance, uh, Owen Cox Dance Company. Just, just seeing how this music connects and relates to these contemporary art forms I think builds a bridge for all of us to recognize that that this music is still relevant and it is still offers us um, musical experiences and uplifts us in ways um, that are not not in the past and are no longer a part of of who we are today. I think it very much is. And given the fact that we rarely hear Monteverdi, when we do hear it, it sounds as fresh as the most right. newly written work. Absolutely. So. I think you're I think you're spot on there, Patrick. Uh, it is still it is going to be fresh to our ears for the most part. Yes. 
Um, there are two more really good questions in the chat, which I think um, is a great way for us to wrap up. Um, let me start with uh, this last one from Paul uh, Trilla. Uh, the question is, the discussion of the theorobo was very interesting. Will there be an attempt to make the cello and the other instruments sound like their 17th century counterparts? Can you explain the how we're making the rest of the instruments broke? What about them is is of the 17th yeah. century? Yeah. So so all of the instruments that we're that we're playing are period instruments or period reconstruction. So they're instruments made in, in, in you know in the last 50 years or so maybe, but they're they're built as they were in as they were they were in the Baroque era. So um, some of our instruments, my husband's instrument is 1740. My cello is 1836. Um, it's a little late for the Baroque era, but not very many cellos survived <laughs> the, the Baroque era. And if they did, and they're still in great shape, they're very expensive. Um, but this was a, a very special instrument that I came across actually from a local, um, from a, a local woman. Um, but I think this, the, so the instruments that we're playing on are, we're playing on gut strings. We're using a Baroque bow. So the color and the sound that you will be hearing um, is very much like it would have been in Monteverdi's time. So even with a Theor bow, this sound will, will be um, very characteristic of, of what concerts likely would have sounded like. Um, 1600 early 1600s and, and the harp being used the harp is specifically an early 17th century italian harp um i don't know the dating uh, of of donald's actual instrument but it is at, at the minimum a replica of but very likely a, a harp actually from the early 17th century um so it's not like one you would see uh, at the symphony playing with a large symphony right. or something like that it's it is specifically a 17th century italian harp the only instrument that that we are playing with that is not period are the organs. And that's understandable considering um, the complexity of performing at two different spaces. Um, but both of these organs are, are very colorful and with Elisa at the helm, um, incredibly thoughtful in how she creates um, the right blend of sound and color that reflects the period. Would they, they have used portative organs? Is that what they would have used in Monteverdi's day? They typically would have had very small organs to play from, just small chest organs, um, uh -huh. or some that are four four feet high and three feet deep. Um, some are a little larger than that, but... Mm -hmm. A couple of the other choices we're doing to make the organ sort of as stylistically appropriate as possible. One is we we know there's evidence from the day there there are um, theorists um, and musicians who wrote about the instruments of the time, and we can see these original documents and they talk about how the sound of Italian organs were sweeter and clearer than than German organs, and. There, because organs were able to survive a lot more easily than cellos, uh, s such 17th century German and Italian organs do still exist and can be played. And so modern players have been able to hear those. In fact, I went on YouTube and specifically listened to some 17th century German organs and then listened to some 17th century Italian organs so I could understand what do they mean by it's sweeter and clearer? What does that mean? Um, I was but Modern technology allowed me to, to, to hear that. Um, and so... We're going to choose the stops we can that most closely resemble that is sort of the primary thing we're doing. The second thing is um, because this music could have been doubled, um, a lot of the vocal lines could have been doubled by sackbuts, which are old trombones, uh, uh, broke trombones kind of. Um, uh, sometimes Elisa will will play louder than a normal continuo instrument in a in a way that sort of is to recreate uh, the trombone color and support in the in the largest and most climatic sections. And then the following question is the one I can probably speak to the least, um, but it's an interesting question and I think a fun way to wrap up. Uh, Patricia asks us, can you speak to the broader limiting creative influences at the time of Monteverdi, religious, societal, political? Trilla, is there anything you want to offer to this question before I jump in? 
jump right in. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I can't uh, maybe answer as thoroughly as you'd like, but I can give you a few interesting anecdotes. One limiting factor actually was, um, was St. Mark's itself. A feast like... Um, so well, so I told you that I'm doing a liturgical reconstruction of a Venetian Vespers, and that it's specifically St. John the Baptist. This doesn't really matter to you all, but to me, this matters. I'm specifically not doing a recreation of a Vespers that might have happened in St. Mark's. And that's because um, in St. Mark's, for a feast day as important as St. John the Baptist, they would have brought out in the middle of of the altar, this um, Palo d'Oro. It's this, uh, I mean, is it, it's 10 feet wide and 15 feet tall, big sort of golden arc-like uh, artifact. And when they brought that out, um, the choir always sang on either side of it, and they sang these double choir motets. Well, the fifth psalm we're singing, and the, and the, um, and the Magnificat would fall into that category. It's sort of double choir, and we could split like they would have in uh, St. Mark's. But the first four psalms is a single choir. It's not double choir. So they wouldn't have been performed in St. Mark's for the Feast of St. John the Baptist. Um, so that's just one architectural limitation to, some, to something that needed to happen. Uh, and then the second thing I'll say um, that I think is fun to remember is that there were fewer limitations in Venice than anywhere else in Italy uh, because they did their own thing. They were the center of trade being there on, on the sea. They were, they, they were the most international of any of the cities uh, and, and the most cosmopolitan and the most forward thinking. Twice in the 16th and 17th century, they were excommunicated by the Catholic Church. They were twice excommunicated and they didn't care. They just kept doing their own thing. And in fact, one of the things that made this reconstruction challenging is you can't just pull out your um, your sort of, uh, I was going to use some language that most of us wouldn't know. Um, you can't just pull out a normal book of liturgical order and see what the Romans said was the liturgical order for a St. John the Baptist feast because Venice had their own. They did their own liturgy that was different from Rome, only, you know, hundreds, only a few hundred miles away, but they did a different, um, it wasn't significantly different, but it was a little bit different. Um, and so the chants we're doing are not the chants that they would have sung, those antiphons, they are not what would have been sung in Rome, but specifically what would have been sung in Venice. So that was a limiting factor for me as I had to find all the right pieces. I, t I mentioned that... Um, we, I had to change the fifth psalm out to the memento. That wasn't true in Rome. Um, so again, I had, to, I had to go and do the research. Um, and fortunately, the research has been done. So there, there are specialty uh, books and, and musicologists who, who have expertise in this. Um, and I was able to find the correct rubrics for a Vesper service in Venice of the time. Great. I tell you, uh, Matthew, you and Trilla are just a veritable font of interesting information. I've so enjoyed this hour with you two. It's always a pleasure talking to you both. Uh, anything you want to say? I mean, I imagine anybody who's tuned in is probably aware of when and where and all that. But you, would you just like to repeat that uh, when the concerts are? The concerts are this Saturday and Sunday. Saturday is at St. Mary's Episcopal downtown at 7.30 p.m. Um, ticket sales have been fantastic. Uh, that space is going to be very crowded, uh, so I recommend you coming early. Um, but then stay late because we are going to have a reception after with the drink that was invented in Venice, the Bellini and Italian cookies. So stay for the reception after St. Mary's. Sunday at 3 p.m., we will be at Village Presbyterian Church, and we'll have cookies and lemonade um, uh, for the reception after that. Um, while I have a captive audience, I'll tell you there's some construction that's happening around Village Church. Um, so just, uh, there'll be detour signs, but it'll be a little harder to get there than normal. Um, so plan a little extra time to travel to Village, but there's, the parking lots are still open and you'll be fine. If you leave a little early and follow the detour signs, you'll be just fine. So this Saturday and Sunday, 7, 7.30 and 3 p.m. I love the distinction between Episcopalian and Presbyterian churches. <laughs> of course, the Episcopalian is going to have the Bellinis. So. <laughs> 
No, that's great. Well, uh, I wish you all the best on some successful concerts. I know it will be. And also, uh, congratulations, Matthew, on the incredible growth of Tadam. This is which season now? Which uh... this is this is our big uh, completion of our fifteenth anniversary season. Wow, hard to imagine. You've done remarkable work, and I know you want to do more and even expand more. We're, and we're, how can people reach out to you to give you a hand financially or in other ways? Thank you. Um, well, all the details will be in the program as well. So if you come to the concert, you'll see that there. Uh, but the best place to find us is on our website, um, which is te-deum.org. I suppose you can read that right up there. te-deum.org is our website. If you're not already getting our emails, um, by the nature of you being here, you likely are. But if you're not, that you can sign up to receive our, our email newsletters so you know what's going on. Um, you can see all of our past programs. You can see links to other recordings. Uh, you can see the albums we've we've made and can purchase those if you'd like. Um, it's a lot of great information there. And then uh, Trilla and the Kansas City Broken Consortium has a website as well. Trilla? KCBaroque.org. So we have information about this concert as well as our, our summer season coming up uh, beginning on the 23rd of June. So you'll check in all of that information as well there. Well, Trilla and Matthew, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for sharing your immense knowledge with everybody tonight. Thank you, Patrick. I really appreciate you being here and helping uh, guide this conversation. Thank you. Thanks so much. It's been a blast.